Picture this. It's the year 2140. Someone, somewhere in the world, mines the very last fraction of Bitcoin, the 21 millionth coin. After that, no new Bitcoin will ever be created, zero. But here's what most people don't realize. We're already 93% of the way there. Right now, only about 1.3 million Bitcoin are left to mine. That's it. So what happens when there's no Bitcoin to mine? Does the whole system just shut down? Today we're diving deep into Bitcoin's endgame, and trust me, it's way more fascinating than you might think. Section 1. The Bitcoin Mining Story Let me tell you a quick story. Back in 2010, a guy named Laszlo Haniech made history. He paid 10,000 Bitcoin for two pizzas. Yeah, you heard that right, 10,000 Bitcoin. Today, that's worth over $600 million. But here's the wild part. Back then, Laszlo could mine those 10,000 Bitcoin in just a few weeks using his regular home computer. Fast forward to today, and things are completely different. See, when Bitcoin first launched in 2009, there were people called miners. These are the people who validate transactions and secure the network, who earned 50 brand new Bitcoin every time they successfully added a block of transactions to the blockchain. Back then, mining was easy. You could do it on your laptop while watching Netflix. But Satoshi Nakamoto, Bitcoin's mysterious creator, had a master plan. Every 210,000 blocks, roughly every four years, something called a halving happens. The reward gets cut in half. So it went from 50 Bitcoin per block, down to 25, then 12.5, then 6.25. And as of April 2024, we're down to just 3.125 Bitcoin per block. That's about $350,000 per block at today's prices. Think of it like a pizza. Satoshi started with a whole pizza, and every four years, he cuts what's left in half. Eventually, you're left with crumbs so small you can barely see them. By around 2014, that reward will effectively be zero. But here's the million dollar question. If miners aren't getting new Bitcoin anymore, why would they bother mining at all? And that brings us to the real meat of this video. Because without miners, Bitcoin literally can't function. Unlike gold, which you can hold in your hand whether miners exist or not, Bitcoin needs miners constantly working to keep the whole system alive. So how does this puzzle get solved? Let's talk about it in the next section. Section 2. The Transaction Fees Here's the secret that most people miss. Miners don't just earn block rewards, they also collect transaction fees. Every time you send Bitcoin to someone, you attach a small fee. It's like a tip to miners for including your transaction in the next block. Right now, these fees are pretty small, making up only about 1.8% of what miners earn. The block reward is still the main course, and fees are just the appetizer. But imagine this scenario. It's a busy Saturday in the year 2140. Millions of people worldwide are using Bitcoin to buy coffee, pay rent, send money across borders, whatever. The network is buzzing with activity. Everyone wants their transaction processed fast. So what happens? People start bidding higher fees to get priority. It's like surge pricing for Uber. When demand is high, prices go up. Here's a real example that actually happened. In April 2024, right after the last halving, something called Bitcoin Runes launched. It's a new type of token on Bitcoin. The network got absolutely flooded with transactions. And for a brief moment, transaction fees were so high that miners earned more from fees than from the actual block reward. Some blocks paid miners tens of Bitcoin in fees alone. Now, that was temporary. Things cooled down. But it proved something crucial. When enough people want to use Bitcoin, fees can absolutely support the network. Think of it like a highway toll. Right now, the government, the block reward, pays most of the construction costs. But as Bitcoin matures and more people use it, the tolls, transaction fees, gradually take over, paying for everything. But let's be real for a second. Some people are skeptical. They say, sure, fees spiked once or twice. 
but can they really consistently support billion dollar mining operations? That's a fair question. So let's talk about the other ways miners can survive. Section three, the survival strategies. Strategy number one, demand response programs. This is genius and it's already happening right now. Here's how it works. Imagine you're a Bitcoin miner in Texas running thousands of mining computers. These machines use tons of electricity, but Texas has a problem. They have lots of wind and solar power that's unpredictable. Sometimes there's too much power and sometimes there's not enough. So the electrical grid makes miners a deal like this. Hey, if you voluntarily shut down your machines during peak hours when everyone's cranking their AC, we'll pay you. And it's working. Some miners in Texas earn up to 10% of their revenue just from getting paid to not mine during certain hours. As renewable energy expands, these programs will become even more common. Miners essentially become batteries, absorbing extra power when it's cheap and abundant and shutting off when the grid needs relief. Strategy number two, cheap or free electricity. Imagine you own a small hydroelectric dam in a remote village. You generate way more power than the village can use. What do you do with the excess? You could let it go to waste or you could mine Bitcoin with it. That's exactly what some miners are doing. They find places with stranded energy, power that would otherwise be wasted and mine Bitcoin basically for free. Even if mining rewards drop to almost nothing, these operations can stay profitable because their electricity costs are near zero. Strategy number three, the self-interest play. Here's something people don't talk about enough. By 2014, if Bitcoin succeeds the way believers think it will, we're talking about major investment funds holding it, maybe even entire countries using it as a reserve currency. Picture this, a major nation has 10% of its reserves in Bitcoin. That's hundreds of billions of dollars. If Bitcoin's network stopped working, that wealth would evaporate. So what do they do? They set up their own mining operations to keep the network secure. It's like hiring your own security guards to protect your vault. Some wealthy Bitcoin holders might also mine at a loss just to keep the network healthy because keeping their massive holdings valuable is worth more than the mining costs. Section four, the scarcity factor. Now here's where things get really interesting. Remember how there's a maximum of 21 million Bitcoin? Well, that number is actually misleading. Studies estimate that between three to four million Bitcoin are gone forever. Lost, vanished, people forgot their passwords, threw away hard drives, or passed away without telling anyone how to access their Bitcoin. There's a famous story about James Howells in the UK. Back in 2013, he accidentally threw away a hard drive containing 7,500 Bitcoin. Today, that would be worth over $750 million. He's been trying to dig through the local landfill to find it for years, but the government won't let him. Those coins? Lost forever. So really, instead of 21 million available Bitcoin, we probably have closer to 17 or 18 million. For a global financial asset, that's incredibly tiny. There are 8 billion people on Earth. If Bitcoin becomes truly mainstream, there's not even enough for everyone to own 0.01 Bitcoin. This is where basic economics kicks in. Fixed supply, growing demand equals rising value. Gold is valuable partly because it's scarce. Bitcoin is programmed to be even scarcer. Section five, what's next? So after all, 21 million Bitcoin have been mined. Experts believe that the mining industry also evolves. It won't be the Wild West anymore. You'll probably see more professional operations, more institutional involvement, more sophisticated financial products around it. Some miners today are already diversifying. They're using their massive computing power and energy infrastructure for AI processing during times when Bitcoin mining isn't as profitable. It's called hybrid mining, and companies like HUD8 and Core Scientific are pioneering it. So, will this actually happen? Nobody knows for certain. It's an experiment that won't fully play out until 2014. But based on what we're seeing now, the fee spikes, the creative survival strategies, the growing adoption, it's looking pretty promising. 
What do you think? Let me know in the comments. Don't forget to check out these two videos popping up on your screen right now. Make sure to like and subscribe. I'll see you there.